my thought for this last week. <clears throat> we should be both practical and idealistic. So we start on the practical side. He said, think not that I am come to abolish the law and the prophets. I am come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Now the one speaking is now present within you. When he awakes, you will hear these words. You will find them to be your words. That one is your own wonderful human imagination. That one is God. The imagination is the basis of all that is. What is now true, to be true as far as we are concerned, was once only imagined. Think of something in the world that is now to you real that wasn't first imagined. So the secret of imagining is the secret of God. And so the secret of imagining is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which everyone should aspire. Because supreme power, supreme wisdom, supreme delight lie in the far-off solution of this mystery. I can acquaint you with it and then leave you to your choice and its risk. But everything in the world is created by this power that I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And none can deliver out of my hand. I create the light and make darkness. I create woe and I make real. And I, even I, am he, and there is no other God beside me. That's your own wonderful human imagination. But we are secret to this power. And you and I, by experiment, we try to discover the secret. As we discover the secret of imagining, <coughs> pardon me, we are discovering the secret of God. So God and imagination, human imagination, are synonymous terms. They're interchangeable. So when we read that if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained that which we requested of him. If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, no, he's great. Now, you may sit down and commune with what you think to be another than yourself, God. But because they are billions of us in the world, and there is but one God, and this fabulous universe, you might wonder if he hurts you. But you have no doubt in your mind if you identify God with your own wonderful human imagination that he hurts you. Can you believe that your own wonderful human imagination is God? So when you sit down as told in the fourth psalm, commune with your own heart upon your bed and be silent. He hears you if you commune with self, but can you believe that communion with self was communion with God? Can you now assume that you are the one that you would like to be. Can you assume that one that you love is as you would like her or like him to be? Can you really believe that you are answered? I do not expect tonight that after a certain conception that the child will be born tomorrow the vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait. It is sure, it will not be late. A little child takes nine months, a lamb five months, a chicken twenty-one days, an elephant, so they tell me, a year or more, a horse a year anyway. 
For every conception has its own appointed hour. <clears throat> it ripens, it will flower. If it seems to you long, then wait. It is sure. It will not be late relative to its own nature. So can I now commune <clears throat> and expect that my communion with self is communion with God? <clears throat> can I dare to assume that I am exactly what I want to be? Can I dare to assume that I am where I want to be? Even though at the moment my reason denies it, my senses deny it. Will it work? Well, it costs you nothing. Try it. Doesn't cost one penny to try it. As you're told, come, buy wine, buy milk without money, without price. Come and take it. Doesn't cost you one penny to dare to assume that you are where you would like to be. <clears throat> Though at the moment, reason denies that you are. Now, I am telling you what I know from experience. But I didn't have a nickel and desired a trip that would cost me well in excess of $1,000. And I dared to assume that I was where I would like to be. And I viewed the world from that assumption. Instead of thinking of it, I thought from it. Then I thought of where physically I was. And I saw that place in my imagination... 2,000 miles to the northwest of me. And I slept in that assumption. And then in a way that I did not consciously devise, I had no way of knowing how it would ever work. But in a way I did not know, it unfolded. And that assumption hardened into fact. On the strength of that, I tried it again and again. And when it worked, I began to teach it. I began to tell others that their imagination is the cause of the phenomena of life. This was long before I realized the promise as recorded in Scripture. This was only the law. So we are told, Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. In all that he does, he prospers. He didn't say it was good for you. He left that entirely up to you to make the decision. You could choose something that may be horrible in time. You choose it without contemplating consequences. But he tells you, your imaginal act is a fact. Now, as he awakens within you, he reinterprets the law. He can't change the law. He interprets the law. Instead of abiding by the external traditions of our fathers. He tells us what the law really is when he awakes within us. You have heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, any man who looks lustfully upon a woman has already committed the act in his heart with her. He tells us that the restraint of that impulse is not enough. The act was committed at the moment of the imaginal act. I may contemplate the consequences and be afraid. My reputation will be at stake if they catch me. But at that very moment of the imaginal act, that was the fact. That's how he interprets the law. Well, now, no one can stop you from imagining. No one can stop you from imagining that you are secure. But you may say, I have no one in this world to whom I could turn, who could leave me a penny. And I have no money. I am beyond the age where they would employ me. And you could give yourself a thousand reasons why it could not be. He not, he's not asking for any reasons. <clears throat> can you imagine? Or who can stop you from imagining? That's all that concerns the awakened man within you. Can I dare imagine that I am what I want to be? Well, I can. I've done it. A number of times. I have done it successfully for many that I love dearly. Many that I do not know. I have failed often too. But the failure is in me. It is not in the law. <clears throat> Imagination plus faith 
is the stuff out of which we make the world. We are told all things were made in this manner. He calls a thing that is not seen as though it were seen, and the unseen becomes seen. And when I come to him, I must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who believe in him. <clears throat> I must have faith in the imaginal act. If tonight I can stand here and simply quietly imagine a state <clears throat> and really believe that I am in communion with God when I did that, and that my imaginal act is God's act, it's not something other than God, and go unconcerned as to the results, the results will follow me. For that imaginal act was causal at the moment that I did it. The effect, when it appears, I may try to trace the effect to some physical cause <clears throat> and give all credit to a physical cause. I tell you, every physical effect has an imaginal cause and not a physical cause. A physical cause only seems. It is the delusion of our fading memory. We do not remember when we imagined it. In this audience tonight, and he may not even remember when he did it, <clears throat> is my dentist. And I went to him in great need of a lot of work, for I had had dentistry all over this country and in London and in Barbados, and it all was horrible. <clears throat> I was always on the move. I was in the theater, getting tongue for a week. What could they do when I needed such work? They patched me up. So when I met him... He gave me a complete job because I was here, living here then. <clears throat> when one day a tooth gave way, which was an anchor tooth, he said to me quite innocently, whether he remembers or not, when I saw your mouth and did this, I said to myself, this tooth will last 13 years. It was 13 years. Had he only said 25, but he didn't think I would live that long. <clears throat> so, 13 years, out came that anchor tooth, and therefore complete restructure of my entire mouth. He set it in motion. Whether he remembers or not, he said, this is going to last 13 years. He didn't tell me. didn't have to tell me. That was his imaginal act. I was only the victim of his creative power. Now, I'm telling you, don't take anything lightly. You are creating morning, noon, and night. Your imaginal acts <clears throat> are God's acts because your imagination is God, and there is no other God. God actually became as we are, became man, that man may become God. And he set up within himself, in man, <clears throat> a series of events which he will now unfold within man, which the one in whom he unfolds it will know he is God. He calls it giving glory unto man. <clears throat> I will not give my glory to another, he said. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, I do it. For my own sake. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God's glory is God. As told us in the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus. I will make my glory to pass before you. And I will cover you. And when I have passed by. So my glory is equated with the I of God. For his name is I Am. He cannot give his glory, which is himself, to another. So in becoming man, he puts man through the furnaces. But then read the story carefully. He took upon himself all of my infirmities and bore my diseases. Who else suffers? But I will say, what I suffer, well, that's God. But I'm feeling it. 
He isn't. There's no he. His name is I am. And so I feel the pain. I feel the infirmities. I feel the diseases. That's God. So the fool says in his heart, there is no God, nor son of God, that thou of human imagination art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill, thou also suffers with me, although I behold thee not. I do not behold imagination as I behold you, an object in space. I am the reality that is named imagination. But I cannot actually see it as an object in space. I see the results of my imagining, but not the being imagining, for God is invisible. Then the voice replies, Fear not. I am with you always. Can I ever get away from imagining? If I fall asleep now and I start dreaming, what is dreaming but imagining? When I wake, he's still with me. I'm still imagining. I am with you always. Only believe in me that I have power to raise from death thy brother who sleeps in Albion. This comes now to the promise that he made all of us. His promise is to give himself to us as though there were no others in the world, just you. Because in giving himself to you, there is no other. Your whole vast world is yourself pushed out. Everything in the world is yourself pushed out. And you manipulate it by your imaginal acts. Everything in the world. Now, the first act begins with the resurrection. It's not outside of you, in spite of what you've been taught. The day will come, you will rise within yourself. And that's the only God that was ever resurrected, who will ever be resurrected. It's not another, it's you. And when you rise, there is no one on the outside. It's all you. And you are rising in the only tomb in the world where God was ever buried. And that's your own skull. God is buried in the human skull and that's where he rises. And when he rises, as foretold by his own words in scripture, he is born. Resurrection begins the act. That same night you come out of the tomb, which is your skull, and you are born from above. Not from the womb of woman where the garment was born. You are born from above. Born of God. Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, you are self-begotten. God begets himself in you. As told us in the epistle to the Hebrews, he is bringing many sons to glory. But the sons are numbered. Everyone born of woman is that son of God. As told us in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, he has set bounds to the peoples of earth according to the number of the sons of God. But you would say, but look, there are three billion in the world. So what's that? I will make them more numerous than the stars, more numerous than the sands of the beach. Well, count them. You can count the stars. We estimate them to be at trillions and trillions. These are the sons of God. Bring in each that he chooses. He didn't bring all together. He brought a certain number. And that certain number he calls the second son. The second son is represented by this fabulous number. The first son is still waiting to come out. He complains because the second son went berserk, went amok spent his power unwisely. Then he came to his senses and returned to his father, and the father embraced him and gave him the authority of himself. He gave him the ring, gave him the robe, the fatted calf, everything for the one who went out and came back to the father. For his gift is the gift of himself to you who came out. I chose you 
in me before the foundation of the world. That's what we are told. Let the first son complain. He'll complain and complain. I served you and you gave me nothing, not even a kid. He said, my son, all that I have is yours. But the most fabulous gift in the world or possession in the world is without meaning unless there is a knowledge of it and a readiness to use it. Going out as we did, we become aware of our possession. Then we can use it. Unless we went out into the world and misused it as we have done, we could not become aware of this power that is our own creative power, our imagination. I saw it so clearly one night. Here I am in this fabulous field of sunflowers, huge, lovely sunflowers. Each sunflower was a face, the human face, but they were all anchored in the earth. And I walked up and down among the sunflowers. They moved like an orchestra moves. They all moved in unison. If one smiled, they all smiled. If one didn't smile, no one smiled. They simply followed like an orchestra. If one bent over, they all bent over. And everyone did what the whole did. One, I didn't say one led them, seemed automatically to do it. And I felt, though I was alone, I could walk up and down, and they were anchored. They couldn't do it. I felt that I was freer, limited as I was, than all of them put together, beautiful as they were, these sunflowers of human faces. But they had not gone out. I was once a part of that infinite garden, not aware of what I possessed. And my father chose me and him before the foundation of the world, and we went out to go through hell in this world, that I may become aware that all thine are mine, to become aware that all that is God belong to me, I had to go through the furnaces of affliction. And having gone through the furnaces, then he awakes within me. And he tells me how I will know he has awakened within me. He set up in the beginning the result of the experiences of humanity. And that result is a son. And the son is called David. And when I find him, I will know he is my son. And I will know the 89th song. I have found David. He has cried unto me, Thou art my son, my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. Well, I found him, and he cried these words to me, and I knew exactly who he was, and I knew then who I am. Until then, I did not know I was one with God. He is God's son, God's only son. Now, he's my son. I tell you, you're going to find him, and he will be your son. And because he is my son, you and I are one. How can he be your son? And I know he's my son. And you and I not be one father. So we are told there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. So in the end, they will not be Greek and Jew, bond and free, male and female, only one, all one in God. And you will be that God. So this is the promise that he made. Now, when I read the Bible, I take all the related parts of the promise and put them all together. For all of these things put together will find their fulfillment in you. All his promises find their yes in him, as you read it in the second Corinthians. All the promises of God find their yes, their fulfillment in him. So there are 39 books. Together they form one book. But the context, which means the meaning of it, you'll find related, scattered over the 39. He pulls from this, from that, from the other, written over the centuries, and pulls them into one pattern. So Christ is the pattern man. That pattern is buried in man. It's the only Christ in the world. When the pattern unfolds in man, it unfolds in man as the man in whom it unfolds. And then he knows who he is. And he has no doubt in his mind as to who he is. He is the Lord spoken of in Scripture. And that Lord is God the Father. And the whole thing unfolds within him. But he does not abolish the law that he gave. He explains the law as a psychological law and not a physical law. 
So if I long after someone at that very moment, the act was committed. I state boldly. I stated boldly as my dentist stated it boldly. It was committed. So I went blindly on, enjoying everything he did. It was perfect. And suddenly comes a little bleeding thing, which no one could stop. Out comes the tooth. He set it in motion the day he said to himself, not to me, it'll last 13 years. I checked it. It was 13 years. So Blake said in his wonderful Jerusalem, Oh, what have I said? What have I done? Oh, all-powerful human words. For the word of man is the word of God. And the word shall not be turned unto me void. It must accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent him. But man forgets his word. Then it comes up and he looks for a physical cause for it. Now we start searching. Well, you know what? Well, this, your system has run down. Did you have fever? Did you have so-and-so? And you ask a thousand questions of the one. Did you have so-and-so? You said no, no, no. No one thinks of that moment when the word went out. So the word goes forward, and it cannot be turned unto us void. It must accomplish that which I purpose, and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I can see my father now, back in 1919. There were ten of us. Nine boys and a girl. He was a ship chandler. He had a grocery store and a liquor store and a meat store, a regular little grocery. And he supplied ships. And the ships were bringing the boys back from the First World War. And they would tell him all kinds of stories. At dinner, he would say to my mother, we will have another war in 20 years. In 20 years, there will be another war. It will be against Germany, but this time it's going to be Germany and Japan. He didn't mention Italy, but it will be Germany and Japan. We will again have America as our ally. France will be our ally. And Mother would say, Joseph, we have nine sons. In 20 years, they'll all be eligible to go to war. We were kids, 1919. I was 14 years old. In 1939, on the first day of September, war broke. Exactly 20 years. What did my father know of any prophecy concerning this? He was only repeating what he heard from the captains and the stewards and the chief officers as he did business with them. But there were his words. And he said it with conviction because he believed these men knew what they're talking about. And our headline, day after day, they are setting the picture in motion for tomorrow's confusion. There are men who are paid enormous salaries to write scare headlines. All right, so he writes the scare headline thinking it only sells the papers. It isn't going to hurt anyone. It isn't. We are going to fulfill them. We fulfill all of our words because God and man are one. Man is all imagination and God is man and exist in us and we in him. <clears throat> the eternal body of man is the imagination, and that is God himself. And God's word is man's word, and it cannot be turned unto him void. It just can't if he speaks it with conviction. So imagination plus faith, these are uh, the very stuff out of which we fashion our world. So can I tonight be alone and commune with myself and be confident that he heard me. I know that I heard myself. Well, that self is God. If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have obtained, not going to, we have obtained that which we request of him. Read it in John's epistle, the first epistle, the fifth chapter, the fifteenth verse. We have obtained it. Well, it'll take a little interval. It may come tonight, but depending upon what seed you planted, one seed will grow overnight. Other seeds will take a little longer. But each has its own appointed hour. There's not a thing wrong in your noble dreams in this world. 
You want to be wealthy? What's wrong with it? You want to be anything? What's wrong with it? Everything is possible. A friend of mine called me last week. He's now appointed the head purchasing agent for the city of Calva. By law, he is not qualified. He does not have the educational background. The law demands you must have a college degree. He doesn't have anything outside of high school. They rearranged it to appoint him the head purchasing agent of Culver City. Why, he came here, he and his brother, I buried the brother a few years ago. He got this job not dreaming for one moment he could ever transcend it. I said, don't for one moment entertain that thought, Dwayne. The job is yours if you want it. Don't push the other one out. Let him go higher. You want to be the purchasing agent of the whole city of Culver? You are the purchasing agent. Sleep in it just as though it were true, and you hurt no one. Last week, they rearranged the law, and he's appointed purchasing agent to take effect in July. Now, everything was rearranged. Everything would be rearranged for you. A friend of mine who told me here that you aren't allowed to speak at any state university unless you have a college degree. Well, he confessed he did not have one, but he was invited by the professor at UCLA to take his class, I think there were three or four classes, in the use of imagination, in advertising. And so here he went in without the degree, and he was given... Well, all the freedom that the professor enjoyed, and he gave either three or four lectures. Instead of the professor who went off for those uh, three or four lectures. So they suspended the rules. They'll suspend every rule. You're not supposed to do this, not supposed to do that. Ignore it. Ignore every rule. As my friend used to say to me, and he said, You can't smoke in here. Look, no smoking. And he was a very wonderful lad. He said, he didn't say positively. <laughs> and so he would go right through the gate to the uh, airplane. And I would say, Mort, you cannot smoke in here. It's not supposed to smoke. He didn't say positively. And here's Mort going right through with his cigarette. No one stopped him. I'm not saying that you should do it. He didn't do it to brag. He simply believed in himself. He wouldn't hurt anyone. Now, you don't have to hurt anyone. I tell you, your own wonderful human imagination is immortal. That's the man in you that cannot die. I meet them, those who are called dead, and I tell you, they aren't dead. Nothing dies. Everything is restored. Everything is restored. But the day will come, you'll go beyond restoration, and you will resurrect and who is resurrecting? God. And God in you awakens, and you are God. Because God is the father of David. That is the way you know you are God. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. These are the words of David. What is going to happen to you? Then you will know you are God. You have no other way of knowing that you are God. Unless God's only Son calls you Father. For no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So no one has seen God. But the only Son who is in His bosom, He has made Him known. And He comes out of you and calls you Father. And then you know who you are. And I'm telling you, every one of you, because you and I were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen for the purpose of receiving the gift of God, which is his glory. For he gives me himself, and in giving me himself, if he's a father, then give me your son. You can give me yourself, in part. Give it to me in totality. So if you are a father, then where is your son? Your son must be my son. And he gives me his son. So he so loved us, he gave his only begotten son. To whom? To you, to me, to every child born of woman. To every one of us who will become fully aware that we are God. And yet, I will know you as Jim. 
I will know you as Jim, but I will also know that you are God. I'll know you as Saad and know you are God. I'll know you as Bill and know you are God. I'll know every one of you. And the unnumbered billions that are not known to me here, in that day I'll know them all. And still know them all as God. For there is nothing but God. When the curtain comes down on the final act, we're all God. We are then the glory of God. So we will finish the work. He said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. It's returning now. The whole memory returns, and then every man becomes God. But now do not fail to apply the law. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. In all that he does, he prospers. You name it, and you can be it. You just name it. And if you dare to assume that you are it, and view the world from that assumption instead of thinking of it, you will crystallize it. You will actually manifest it in this world. That definition of imagination, I'll go along with for a certain point, up to a point. That things present are sense-perceived and called real. Things absent are called imagination. But man being all imagination, man must be wherever he is in imagination. So I need not be anchored to where my senses dictate. I can stand here and assume that I am elsewhere. And then, if I assume that I am elsewhere, let me anchor myself there and view the world from it. If I view the world from it, I should see this place as I would see it were I physically there. I can see it surrounded me and under me. Then I did not move in imagination. If I move in imagination, then I must think of where I was physically and see it elsewhere. I can see it where I am in imagination and be moved. For all motion, well, I can tell myself if I have moved by a frame of reference. If I have moved relative to this room, well, then let me look to see where am I now. I must have moved, for motion can be detected only by a change of position relative to another object. Well, here is the object. I assume now that I am, and I name it. If I am elsewhere, let me think of this room. Well, I can't see it as I now see it. If I see it as I now see it, then I didn't move. I can only move if I see it differently. Well, now, if I move, and now I'm standing in my home, sitting in my chair in the living room. Now, let me think of this club. I must see it away down on Catalina and feel myself at home on Carroll Street and then think of the club, and it can't be here. It has to be away down on Catalina. Then I moved. For man being all imagination, he must be wherever he is in imagination. If I practice this, it becomes easier and easier. I just read of the story of a very dear friend of mine who used to come to my, not so many meetings, but I would say once a month he came home for a personal appointment in New York City. He was killed last week in a car driven by her husband. And I can now see this perfectly lovely, gracious lady. She had a home in Oyster Bay in Long Island. And she had her apartment in New York City. Her name is possibly one of the most prominent names in America. The name is Roosevelt. She was of the Teddy Roosevelt branch. Her name was Grace. His, her husband was Archibald. Teddy was governor of New York. He was vice president of our country. He was president of our country. A very powerful, wonderful leader. He did not leave, as so many presidents leave, a fortune. He didn't go in there to make a fortune. He went in there to lead the country. And as he said, I don't consider public opinion. I form what I think is best for our country, and I feed them what they ought to know. I feed them what I think is best for our country. So he didn't go in there to make a personal fortune, and he came out without a personal fortune. So she, in spite of her name, did not have a personal fortune. She had a home in, Long, in uh, Oyster Bay in Long Island and a lovely apartment, beautifully furnished on things that her father-in-law had given. 
If she did not rent her New York apartment for the summer, she could not open her home in Long Island. She couldn't afford it. Being a lovely home in a very wonderful, fashionable area of New York City, she always got a wonderful price paid in advance for the three or four months. Then came the end of a season where they aren't looking for any home, and she came to see me. She said, Neville, I am desperate. Unless I rent the place in New York City, we can't open our home in Long Island. I said, all right, it's rented and you're living in Long Island. Oh, but she said, Neville, I can't do that. I said, tonight you sleep in your home in Long Island. But she said, I can't do that. How could I go and sleep there? I said, you don't do it physically. Tonight you sleep physically in New York City in your apartment. But in your imagination, which is the only reality, you sleep in your home in Long Island. And then you think of your place in New York. And the reason why you see it across the East River is because you are physically sleeping in Long Island. And the reason why you're sleeping there is because you rented it. Put them all together, that's why you're there. She said to me, if it rents, I'll call you. I said, there's no if about it. If, the only if is, if you do it, then you'll call me. I took her to the elevator. She went downstairs, went back to her place. The next day, at nine in the morning, Mrs. Roosevelt is on the phone. She said, Neville, this is Grace Roosevelt. I said, how are you, Mrs. Roosevelt? She said, I'm calling you from Long Island, where I slept last night physically. That I went home. No one came at all over the period that your rent places. But as I got home, soon after I got home, an agent called and asked if I could show the apartment. A single man came in. He liked the place. Money meant nothing to him. He said, I want immediate possession. But I mean immediate. I mean now. But she said, I can't get out now. I have to call my husband at the office. I don't care what you do. I want immediate possession. And here is my check in advance. Call the bank to see if the check is good. She got out that day. Called her husband to meet her. And off they went to their home in Long Island. Well, she was just killed last week at the age of 73, I think it was. He was driving, he wasn't injured, and the friend in the car wasn't injured, but Grace was killed instantly. But at least she learned the law. She didn't come to the meetings very often because she said in her capacity, she was a pillar of the Episcopal Church in New York City, also in Long Island, and it would not be advisable to be seen in my meeting place. That's coming, that's slumming. But she always came to my home to any problem. One, she had it with her son. He came back from Egypt, where he was in the State Department. And he came with a huge big beard. And she said, Neville, I'm embarrassed. It's long before people wore beards. Today, it would be the thing to do. But he came back long before the young fellows wore beards. With a huge big beard. She said, Neville, I'm so embarrassed, I just don't want to walk down Fifth Avenue with him. I make him walk ahead, walk behind me. I don't want to be seen with him. What must I do? Because he gets annoyed and he will do nothing that his father and I suggest. I said, how would you feel if you kissed him and he had no beard? You would kiss your son, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. Well, then put your hand on his face and he doesn't have any beard. And then kiss him and feel that smooth skin that is your son's face and he has no beard. All right, I will do that. She didn't tell me. I opened the morning paper one Monday morning. It was a big fashionable social wedding, and here is Mrs. Roosevelt and her husband, and here is her son, and here is the bride coming down the steps of the Episcopal Church, and he has no beard. The next time she came to see me, I reminded her. I said, you know, you came here the last time about the beard, and the beard is off. She said, you know how, why? I said, yes, I know why, but you tell me why. Well, the girl that he married refused to go through with it unless he shaved. She saw the physical act. I said, no, that wasn't it. You promised me that you would kiss him and feel his smooth skin. And you feel the smooth skin and it would come off. She said, I did do it. But the girl demanded it. So she goes back to a physical causation and it wasn't so at all. There is no natural effect with a natural cause. 
Every natural effect has an imaginal cause, and the natural only scene. So she is still going to insist it is because the girl wanted the bear off. That's why he took it off. Well, now she knows better. She's now in a world just like this. At least she learned the lesson of the law. She didn't learn the promise, because when I spoke to her, I did not have the promise. I had not realized it. You know the promise because it only happened to me 12 years ago this coming month. So those who know, knew me before have not heard from me the promise. Those who have known me since, well, I, they know the promise. So I ask you tonight to please take it seriously. Watch your every imaginal act. And I will say to everyone, don't take anything lightly. Don't voice an opinion. Yes. 